Hi, my name's Kathy Mellett, and I'm going to show you how I made this ultra realistic grass diorama, complete with weather train and people. And a really big thanks to Knock for sponsoring this video. So when Knock approached me about doing a sponsored video, my first thought was, the Lake District has a lot of grass. So I dug out some photos from a holiday in February a few years ago, and this one had everything I needed, river, and loads of different types of grass and reeds to show you. So I put it in Photoshop, brightened a few areas so I could see into some of the darker sections, and then I needed to measure it and distort it to fit onto this A4 canvas. So I got the little man who's gonna be crossing the river, and I used him as a measure, and then worked out how big my river had to be, and then I actually just did a very poor sketch in Photoshop, which I used to plan the diorama. Picture frames are a favourite of mine for diorama bases. You need to rip that sort of stand thing off the back, very easy to do, and then remove the perspex in the front. Sadly, this was glass. I thought I ordered perspex and it was hot glued in, so I snapped it. But, oh well, don't do that yourselves at home. The front of the river is going to be cut away into the frame, so I marked up the area and drew an outline. I dremeled that edge away, and you can see I'm deadly serious about my protective, especially on my eyes, protective goggles and mask. I started off with a sanding drum, and that's a hoover by the side to catch any bits, but I found it just melted the plastic, so I quickly moved on to a slitting disc, metal one because I find they're safer, before going back to the sanding drum to smooth everything off. You can clean up any leftover silver sharpie with some isopropyl alcohol. Because I want to carve the river out, I'm using a very dense XPS foam. It's extruded polystyrene foam. I get it on Amazon and it used to be blue and now it's black. And it came with a couple of very thin offcuts. Um, they're just the same sheet, but they're slightly weird underneath. And I use those just to space this up to exactly the right height. I used the back of an X-Acto blade to score round the plan river, so I had the mark on my base. I used Foam Factory hot wire tools, the carving tool, the routing tool, to carve away the riverbed. I did use the outline as best as possible. Um, I wasn't so bothered if the bottom was over deep, but I needed it to be exactly the right shape on the outer edges and to be deep enough for the stones to go in. For the railway track, I'm using Pico Code 80 009 Irregular Track. It's a narrow gauge track, so I can get a nice curve on it and it'll add a bit of interest. I needed to raise it up though. In the photo, there's a pathway or something there that's raised up. And instead of using a sort of footpath, which would be a little bit boring, I'm putting this railway track on there. So I cut out a section of the slightly thinner odd sheets that I had and use those to raise it up. The top one is flat and very, very thin. The next one down is a little bit wider because I need this to be in a sort of built up shape. And I just carved it then so that it didn't have square edges. And finally, there's the start of a hill or something on the right hand side, and that's gonna mask the stream or river going off wing, if you think of this as a theater. So it needs a little bit of height, which I put in with some foam. I glued these in place with tacky glue, which is just a thick white glue. And I don't need to worry about the fact it's foam because this one's so weird on the bottom that the air will get in and dry it no problem. And then I just weighted them and left them to dry. I cut my track roughly to length using Zurong track cutters. I'll trim it when it's in place. I used a fairly thin sculpt mold to fill in all the gaps and to create any missing landforms. I want it to be quite bumpy because I want texture in the grass, so I've not tried to particularly smooth it out. Towards the end, I did smooth out the areas that have got the footpath, which runs alongside the river and then over the railway line and into the distance. I wanted the railway track to look like it was just embedded into the ground. I'm not really gonna do any ballast, maybe a little bit of grout. So for that, I just pushed it down into the sculptor mold and used cocktail sticks to hold it in place. I won't need to glue it, the sculptor mold will do that for me. I wanted to embed my stones and rocks whilst the sculptor mold was still wet and I could get them sat below the surface. They weren't just sat on top of it. So to do this, I use Woodland Scenics and I started with extra coarse 
all the way through to fine. This is just the natural colour and I'm going to paint it later. But I pushed down the really big rocks and I used the photo that I had to place them to make sure they were typical and they'd also create slight dams in the river so I can get the change that I need in there. The whole of the riverbed in the photo is covered with stones. I think it's too fast moving for anything else. So I made sure that there were plenty of medium and larger stones in there just to give the effect that I wanted when the resin goes in. The larger stones will be held in place by the sculpt mould, which is gripping them well, but the smaller ones will just stay loose. So for, before I do the next stage, I needed to glue them down. So I sprayed on 99% isopropyl alcohol, about a third alcohol, two thirds water through a spray bottle. And then I dripped on a mix of a third white glue, two thirds water didn't quite stick them. In fact, they never quite stuck most of the way through and I had to come back and do several coats before those fine stones finally stuck. I cleaned the damp sculpt mould off the edges and I used masking tape to keep the frame tidy. Because 90% of the um, ground is going to be covered in grass and you won't see the earth colour, I don't need to worry too much about an earth coat. I will put a fine spray of brown on, but for now I just wanted to make sure that the path area and any earth that's showing on the banks of the river and the area around the railway actually have their sort of earth texture. And this is all about the texture of it rather than the colour. So I've used a brown tile grout and I put it on with a brush. I smooth the path areas with my finger and I make sure that I cover all the areas that I need to keeping very much the texture of the grout. And I used it in a couple of places to build up some of the ripples I could see in the pictures that I have and to just bed in any stones that looked a little proud on the surface still. I don't mind if I get the brown grout onto the stones because it will just add a bit of variation in colour. Once I was happy with the texture of everything, I sprayed isopropyl alcohol and water, this one third, two thirds mix in a fine spray bottle. It's important it's a fine spray bottle and you missed it on or you're just going to disturb the texture you've put on there. But it's really important you do this on a tile grout layer, especially as this is unsanded grout. And there's a real danger that the glue won't sink down through to any deep layers. Now I've kept it fairly thin, but there are some areas where it won't necessarily go in properly and the glue will ball on the surface if it's not pre-wet. Once that was there, I sprayed it all with dilute matte Mod Podge. Now I need it to be about a sixth matte Mod Podge to the rest of it water to get it through my spray. So it's quite dilute, um, but I soaked this. I soaked it a lot and I went back and did a second coat and soaked it again, just to make sure that everything was stuck. I had a little bit of burnt umber in my airbrush from weathering my stock. So I used that to coat the sides of the rails and ties. And as I still had some left over, I covered up the white sculpt mould. It's going to get grass on it eventually anyway. Whilst airbrushing, I realised that some of my stones were still a little loose. And to make sure everything was well glued down, I put another coat of glue on. You cannot be too sure. The next day, I hand painted my stones. I used a mix of neutral grey white, a little bit of yellow ochre and some tear vert just to add some lichen. I used really dilute mixes and they're just artist acrylics with water, but I wanted to make sure that the texture of the rock wasn't obliterated by brush strokes in any way. And artist acrylics can be quite thick, so it's something you do have to watch for. And I built up a number of layers. First of all, I did a neutral grey over all of my rocks um, and I found a couple that were unstuck still, but I wanted to make sure that they all had a sort of common grey, even though some of them will be a bit browner because they've got tile grout on them. Next, I added some white to the mix and again, just went over all the rocks before finally adding some yellow ochre and highlighting one or two rocks that in the pictures looked a little bit more warm toned rather than the cooler grey. When that was done, I mixed up some lichen colours with the tear vert to add a bit of green to the yellow ochre and I put those on. I've not really gone too green with the stream bed, river bed, because it's quite fast flowing and I don't think there's much chance for algae to grow down there. A final splodging, technical term, of white just bedded everything in together. I also dry brushed some of the grey onto the visible ties on the track. Some of them are buried and I didn't dry brush those, but I just needed to make them look a little bit more weathered and grey. 
showed how to make an acrylic black wash in a recent video and I used it here on the bed of the river just to add depth. It's a slightly darker colour as we get down to the bottom of the river in between all those rocks and stones and to cover up any white spots from rocks that have moved or there wasn't quite enough targa out there. I used a brush to remove any excess wash that was sat on the surface of rocks in the stream and then I also used it to add the wash to all the rocks that weren't on the stream bed itself because I wanted them to get the crevices in those rocks, the talus, to show so there's a little bit more depth to those rocks. I like to do the main pour of resin before I put grass in because I've had problems with it creeping through the grass in odd ways in the past. So the first thing to do is to put a good solid dam in. Nobody wants leaking resin all over their worktop. I glued a piece of acetate in using just white glue. It's tacky glue, so it's a little bit thicker. Now I know this is going to take a while to dry, so it's going to be overnight, but I want all of that ink and everything to be dry as well before I pour any resin. Now a nice solid bead of tacky glue and push the acetate in place. The next day I used magic water for my resin. It's a little bit old but it's a two to one mix and I do it by weight because it's the easiest way. I only mix 20 grams and 10 grams. I didn't put any colour in because the hardener was already quite brown and I didn't want it any darker than this. It's a fast moving but relatively clear river. And yes, I did forget my gloves at the beginning. I find it easiest to pour it down something like the stirring stick, it kind of directs the flow. And I made sure that I covered the whole base. It did flow through everything, it's quite a mobile kind of liquid, it will get into all the nooks and crannies, so I didn't need to do much on this. And I just put it level and left it somewhere nice and warm and sunny with a white piece of paper over the top to keep the dust off. Now this video is sponsored by Knock and it's worth me saying a little bit about them. Well, I've used Knock for my grass since almost the beginning. My first ever static grass applicator was one of their puffer bottles. My second one was their Grassmaster One. So when they offered to sponsor this video and for me to get some products I was very excited. There's all sorts of things in here that are going to be brilliant for the Lake District diorama and also there's a new Grassmaster 3. So what was that like? Well out of the box I noticed two improvements. One, it's got a cap so your grass doesn't have to fall out, you can just put the end on if you want to and two, it stands upright so when you're loading it it's much better. It also comes with a battery included. And the grass bags are now resealable. Result. The real test though is how does it do? So here's some two and a half mil already down with some six mil going over it. Wow, it worked really well. Nice, vertical, very, very static grass, just what you want. So now it's time to put that grass master through its paces on the diorama. So first up, glue. I've always used white glue in the past and if I had the odd ball spot I wasn't that worried and to be honest I would normally put a very brown coat under this so the odd ball patch is fine. Some of the glues I've used are quite glossy which isn't great because if the glue hasn't attracted enough grass then you end up with a gloss patch and all in all I've never really stumped up for proper grass glue but Nock sent me some and I've used it and it's been really really good it stays tacky for longer in fact it doesn't dry particularly quickly so it's good it, it grabs grass for longer which with this where I've been using a brush and a micro brush which is just a small disposable brush to um to put it round very carefully around all those rocks and it's taken quite a lot of time to get the glue on it's still remaining sticky which has been vitally important now i've started here with two and a half mil summer grass by knock it's a bit bright for what i want and that's fine because um it, it's the perfect grass for the summer it's just i'm doing february Nobody really does sludgy green. It, it's an odd colour to do, but also this is the base colour, so it is going to get some grass on top in a lot of the different places. So what I really wanted to do is make sure that everything had a good coat of this grass, as much for the texture as everything else. So I've put it everywhere, including between the ties, all the places that grass would be. I've made it the path quite narrow with patchy grass along it, and I've carefully wiped it off the river every time I've put it on. Now I waited two Two days for this resin to set because when I looked at it yesterday it was still had a squeaky feel to it when you rubbed your fingers over the top of the resin and I'm always worried the grass is going to stick into it and it's impossible to get grass out of things that are not 
um, solid. So I waited an extra day and it paid off because my grass hasn't stuck, but I'm still not chancing it. So I use a brush to get it off every single time and I blow off the excess. I'm very lucky this is a small diorama and you'll notice all the way through I'm turning it upside down and tapping it to get the grass, the excess grass off. And at the end I tipped it all back into the bag and I can reuse all that spare grass. If you are on a layout and you can't do that, a hoover with a pair of tights, pantyhose in some countries, a pair of tights over the end will work very well and you'll be able to reclaim the um, grass that you've sucked up in those pair of tights. Um, if you haven't got tights, I'm sorry, you will have to go and buy them. I have a plentiful supply upstairs. Now, as next up is painting this, I'm going to leave it a full day to dry. I don't want my airbrush to knock the grass around. And I haven't tried to texture this particularly. It's bumpy underneath, but the texturing will really come in the grass, the dry grass layer that's coming next. I'm going to use several ways to tone down this colour and the first is airbrushing. So I used a ready-made Comart transparent light dust. Mick Bonwick at Missenden Abbey recommended it for fading trains but it works just as well on scenery and it's, a, it's actually a light pale fleshy sand colour. So I airbrush it towards the back mostly but also towards the front. I'm not bothered if I get it on my path, I am bothered if I get it on my river so I do try to avoid spraying that. You will need to turn it around and do it from more than one direction um, otherwise you just won't catch all of the grass. I'm not bothered if I get this on my rocks either because it's more or less the same colour tone. So it is important to choose a colour you don't mind if there's a little bit of overspray when you're doing this kind of general coat. Next up, I got this technique from Luke APS, from Luke from Geek Gaming, and he does terrain to fight over, great catchphrase, a lot of wargaming. And he has put soil over his grass. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Now I'm using tile grout for my soil. So this is the first time I've tried it. And you basically put, it's like putting a powder over your grass, but it's the same color as the dirt. So it's brilliant around the edges of paths for just making the grass look a little bit more sparse, which is hard to do when you're putting glue drops down. And it dulls everything down. It gives a more variety to the grass and the colors are gonna work with your landscape because you've already got that color on there. So it's a win-win. So I covered my diorama with tile grout. Now, if you put it on too thickly, it does look like a bald patch of grass. And I've got a couple of spots like that where I'm gonna put gorse bushes. I'm not bothered about that, but I did find you need a very light hand when applying this. So a big brush and not too much grout is definitely the best. Not surprisingly, before I sealed it, I spent a lot of time cleaning my river. I use just plain water and isopropyl alcohol and a cotton bud, well, several cotton buds, and made sure it was sparkling clean before I sprayed isopropyl alcohol and water, my normal mix, on everything else. Tile does have cement in it and there'll be plenty of glue later to hold it in place, but realistically, it's not going anywhere. Next up, more painting. Now we've put a generic tone coat on and we've put some tile grout on and that was all to tone it down. But what I wanna do now is to color up the dead grass. But I don't really want this grass to be any longer. When I look at the pictures, a lot of the grass around the edges of the river and the path is actually quite short, but it's still got dead grass on top. Now I'm gonna go and add longer dead grass later, but whilst I can still access it, I dry brushed the top of this grass, a lot of it with a dark sand Vallejo color and this is very time consuming if you're doing a large area so perhaps a bigger brush would help for that but actually it makes such a difference on dioramas this size and it's certainly worth considering on a larger size with a bigger brush you need a light hand again and don't worry about splodging it just um, carry on painting it and spreading it out and really it's just about highlighting any tips any clumps anything that looks like it should have a dead top Next up, the gorse bushes. Now I had some brown long grass that I wanted to use, but I needed to put it on something. So I found some pale brown polyfiber. Don't ask me where from, I've had it for years. And I ripped it up into small little sections. In hindsight, I needed a couple of smaller humps as well, but you live and learn. To attach the grass, I use landscaping glue by knock out of the spray bottle. I transferred them to a dry sheet of cardboard so I could reclaim any excess grass. And then I covered it with the brown six mil wire grass. 
this worked really well and they did stand in nice spiky bushes which was brilliant and just what I needed for the gorse. Gorse has spiky leaves and it's brown underneath and a sort of brighter green on top in the summer. So to make sure I got the leaves all the way through the bush, I put on some flock first before I put the glue on and put the rest of the flock on. When I had a good covering, I sprayed it with more of the landscaping glue by Knock. Before transferring to a dry piece of card, tipping out some flock, it was the easiest way in the end, and just adding some more leaves on those tips. I use Vallejo Military Green to add some green to the top branches. Another key feature of the vegetation is the dead bracken. This was lovely and green all through the summer, but by now in February, it's all beaten down. There's hardly any leaves left, but there are some very orangey coloured stalks left. And to make these in HO scale, I used jute cord, which I cut to length and I made way too much. I added water orangey brown paint and earth tan before mixing it all together. I dumped the mix out on some foil and then spread it out carefully, trying to twist it into some kind of shapes and left it to dry, but not too much because once it's dry, you won't get it off the foil, unfortunately. And here's the mid video commercial. First of all, thank you to Knock. They've enabled me to make this video and bring it to you. They also sent me the new Grassmaster 3, which I've got to say, did do some great grass work. And it got all the tall grass to stand straight, which is really good. I've used Knock for years. It's the first grass applicator I ever bought was a Knock Grassmaster. And I've always been really pleased with them. And I think the latest version just builds on what they've already done. They do some great grass colors now. They've brought out the muted range for people who live in an area that doesn't have the bright greens of say the UK or Europe. And whilst we're on the commercial break, please remember this is my full-time job. So if you want to support the channel, pop over to Patreon or pop to my shop at kathymillett.co.uk and buy something. Otherwise subscribe and hit the bell button. Now back to the video. There are two main ways I use to do reeds and the first is definitely the easiest and for that I use grass tufts that are already made. These ones are by Knock and they're a mix of sort of yellows and greens. I know they're slightly the wrong colour for this time of year but guess what I'm gonna paint them. I love grass tufts and they actually go a lot further than you would think. Each of these is a little bit too large for my particular riverbank. Now on a deeply reeded bed they'd be perfect and you'd push them together and they'd create a beautiful texture. But for mine I need something a little bit more sparse. So I tear each one up into three to five pieces. Now this gives a much better shape, they become slightly irregular, but I've still got quite a bit of glue around the bottom and we'll mask that by putting them against a riverbed or putting some grass in later. You won't be surprised to hear that I painted them. I mean these are a beautiful mix of colours and a beautiful green, they just don't match the Lake District in February. So I got out a dark sand and an earth tan Vallejo colour and I coated the ends of all of the tufts that I used. I did leave the bases as the green because they're a little bit more protected um, and they'll also get masked a little with some of the later grass. The edges of the riverbank have quite a lot of moss on them so I used a green very fine ground foam for that and I use not grass glue to just it's quite a thick glue and it stays tacky for a while so I use that to apply it adding the glue and then just sprinkling on the ground foam as well as the near bank I also did it on a couple of the rocks and boulders further up the stream you can just tip the excess off as normal. Then comes the fun part of planting all your tufts. I just dip them in grass glue and plant them around the edge of the river. To reinforce the feeling of scale, I planted the bigger tufts at the front and the smaller tufts towards the back. Another great product to model reeds is called reeds. Now these are incredibly long, so you do need to trim a lot off and just keep the nice fine feathered end. It looks more realistic. I put in the orange and I removed it the next day because it was too bright, but this dark green and black and the paler straw colored ones both stayed. They looked really good. Now before my bracken, that was that orange duke cord that we made, dried completely, I put it on the surface. Now these are just bent over stalks, so I pushed them down and I'm hoping the paint will hold them a little bit in this position and there'll be some glue on them again later. 
And when doing anything with colours and vegetation, it's worth coming back a day later and taking a fresh look at it. So this is the next morning and I looked very carefully at all the colours and I took out the orange reeds. I built up the dead vegetation from the bracken around the stems by using the same brown flock and just pushing it in with a brush so it was around the edges and under the stems where possible. They've not been glued down yet so they're a little bit movable. I glued this using a really dilute mix of glue. It's one sixth glue into five sixth water and it sinks in really easily. It doesn't have a lot of grip necessarily but in this instance for this flock I think it'll be perfect. Next it was time to put in the gorse bushes so I spent a lot of time deciding which way round to put them all. This is where I wish I'd done a couple of smaller humps. They weren't sitting quite flat so I snipped some material out of the bottom. It's quite solid now from the amount of glue that's gone on it and it is mostly just the polyfibre but it meant they fitted better. Once I was happy I tried gluing them in place with grass glue but it just didn't work. These are on a sort of bumpy hill and they just weren't bending enough so instead I used super glue put it in place and zapped it straight away with a spray and that stuck the edges. I don't really like using super glue as it leaves some white marks sometimes so I just covered them up with some matte tan paint. Then eventually I just snipped off the really offending piece. The glue was also a little shiny so I added on some dilute matte Mod Podge because it's matte and it will get rid of the shine. Onto the final coat of grass. Now, why do I need this? Well, those reeds often look like they're just plunked on, especially if they're sat amongst the shorter grass. And at the bottom, there's glue. Um, it's what holds the grass tufts together. So there's always going to be glue on them. Now, around the edge of the stream, you could go up it with your water effect, but all the ones in the middle of the grass need something else. So I applied grass glue in every place where I felt there needed to be a transition. It's also useful on the areas where I was a little heavy handed with the tile grout. Then I just applied golden yellow six millimetre grass with a grass master. As usual, I turned it upside down to reclaim my grass. Very important, save your fortune. And yet again, I dry brushed it. There's two really good reasons to dry brush at this point. One, I wanted the colour to be a little bit lighter and two, the grass is actually always slightly glossy. You'll see this all the way through. And I'll need to address that in a different way as well. This last coat of dry brushing, and it's a dark sand colour again, really makes the grass stand out and just gives that feeling of dead grass. When I checked on my grass later on that night, I could still see quite a lot of gloss. It was almost glowing under different lights. So that's easily solved with something like this Hobby and Craft Sealer. This one's frame safe, so I really like it. And you can just spray it all over. Um, try not to get it to bead too much, but it will dry flat. And it will take any unwanted shine off your grass. It is nylon fibres, so you will quite frequently find a shine if you're not careful. Just protect your water because you don't want that to get matte at this point. Well, that's the grass done. Time to finish off that water. I always like to do the last bit at the end just because you can't get any grass stuck in it. You can clean everything up. So one of the things I don't like about water is when you pour it, you get a meniscus. That means it gets bigger around the edges. It's due to surface tension and the resin creep. Now, if you're doing scenery like tile grout or something, you can put another coat over the top or here, the reeds just mask most of the edges. But on this front edge, it's really noticeable. So I just use a sharp knife and take up that lip. And finally, on to the water ripples themselves. Now, this is quite a white water river, so it's important that we get that feeling of rushing water. And I like to use quite a thick Artis acrylic impasto gel. And I'm putting it on with a brush and using the brush to form the waves. Now, I, I did copy the photo a lot. And if you're not sure what waves look like, photos are an excellent source of trying to work it out. This does dry a little bit flatter than when it goes on and it will dry clear, but it takes some time. But the basic principle is put on some impasto gel and then just push it in fan shaped motions to create the waves with the tips of your brush. I'm forcing perspective very heavily with this river. So it's only a titchy little stream a few inches back. So my waves got smaller as I got further back. By the next morning, the gel had nearly dried clear. You can still see some of the white and that's quite helpful for when you come to add the white back in. To do that, I use white paint 
and gloss mod podge most paint isn't quite glossy enough it's relatively simple just to follow all of the splodges and waves and everything you built in the day before and just touch all of those highlights up with the white paint the next morning it had dried a bit matte not really a problem and almost to be expected. I went over it with some gloss Mod Podge. This contains a varnish as well, so it does dry to a nice glossy finish. Once the water was completely dry, I added in some pigments on the path just to bring out some extra variety and detailing. I used concrete and factory gray, just two colors. The important thing here, don't put too much on. It is definitely possible to overdo this stage. I've had this mini train set for, I don't know, 10, 15 years and I've never used it. So I decided this was the perfect outing for it. But I didn't really want a bright blue loco. I actually want a dark green one. So I decided to repaint everything and it all needed weathering anyway. I looked through my Critters in Colour book and I found this gorgeous dark green weathered loco with a yellow undercoat showing through. So I first of all sprayed a yellow on the top of the hood of the loco, but I masked inside to make sure that all of those copper contacts and the PCB didn't get paint on them. The mini trains wagons have some of them all come apart so you can take the top off and they have sort of metal dumpers and, and little wooden everything. So I needed to paint these to make them look a little bit more realistic. On the wooden ones I couldn't get them off so I left those on but I sprayed all of the plastic tops whether they be metal or wood with a middle grey. It's an AK Interactive brush and airbrush middle grey from a wood set. Quite useful. And then when I'd done that, I got a burnt umber out and sprayed all of the trucks and lower areas on the loco so that everything was nice and brown and weathered. I did drop one on the floor and only painted half of it. So see if you can spot that one on the end. The next day it was time for the locomotive to get its weathering. So first up I sprayed on some worn effects by AK Interactive. This is the equivalent of hairspray and we're going to be doing a chipping technique using it. I sprayed a coat of Vallejo military green but it's very glossy and I didn't really like the colour as much as I wanted so I then resprayed a second coat of flat green by Vallejo. Then it's on to chipping. For this you use water because it softens the top coat of paint and the worn effects layer underneath. Now Vallejo is very plasticky and will actually pull off the entire side if you're not careful. So I find a brush a little bit too aggressive. So I normally go for a cocktail stick and I get much better results with that. And the effect I was looking at here was a copy from a book and it had sort of peeling patches but very small circular patches all the way randomly spread across the side so that's the effect I was going for but I also used the cocktail stick to wear away any raised details as if the paint had come off those first and when we put the next layer on this won't look quite as drastic as it does now. Well it was over chipped and that is a problem with this particular technique it's easy to go too far so I just painted back the chips with the same green as I'd painted the body of the loco in. Next I used a burnt umber Vallejo just to add a little bit of the body colour of rusted metal round in the middle of each of those yellow chips. Once I had the burnt umber out I used it on all the grey painted metal parts to add rust. I have heavily rusted these because my loco is also quite poorly maintained and I want to make sure they look in keeping with each other. So the first step was to go around and add this brown as the dark rust to all the interiors and in splotches, technical term that, on the side. Finally I did the same using burnt umber to the locomotive frames. I used middle grey brown and light grey as well as middle grey from an AK Interactive wood colour set to paint my wood bodies on the um, rolling stock before finally using the burnt umber to pick out the metal details because they're going to be rusty on these wooden bodies. Checking the photos, I wanted to tone down the green on the roofs and sort of surfaces a little bit. So I used Light Flesh, it's just a very white colour, from Oil Brushes by MIG, which is basically an oil paint, and spread it out with terps and it just fades everything beautifully. You do end up wiping most of it off. Whilst I had the oil brushes out, I used the Earth colour, which is a lovely rust colour, to add some detail to the sides of the metal wagons 
This time I've still got Terps on the brush, but it's mostly dry. So I'm just streaking the rust oil color down in the direction that it would go if water ran onto one of those brown spots and dragged it downwards. Finally, I made a wash, which is just dilute oil paint and put it onto the wooden wagons just to bring out all the line details. This one's the dark mud color. By now the white paint on the loco was dry, so I did exactly the same with the earth colour on all the areas that might be a little bit rusty on that. This is a great technique for adding streaking rust to everything, but just remember moderation is best. It's probably best if you wipe most of this off rather than leaving big splodges of streaks. Next I used a dark MIG wash to highlight the panel lines and the front grille. Using a fine brush, you can just touch the corners and the wash will run along any grooves or grills or anything like that, marking them out. I took the masking tape off and reassembled the loco. I wanted to add a figure, but he was far too tall, so I had to amputate his legs. Look away now if you're squeamish. Bless him. I'd cut him more off too. I glued the man in place and put the lid back on. Now the loco was together, I put on the final pigment weathering. I used a concrete colour to add some dust. I did feel this was a heavy worked locomotive and it may have been in quarries and places like this to get this bad. But for the dust around the hood, I decided to use a factory grey, especially in that grill. Now on the photo I was using, some of this heavy weathering looked like it had oil leakage through it. So I put on a gloss oil. <laughs> Panic! Not to worry, dabbing vigorously with a little bit more powder and pigment on there soon sorted it all out and it faded into a nice dark grungy mass. I then bravely did the same technique along the sides and toned it all down with more pigment till I got a kind of dirty, burnt, grungy look. I wanted the diorama to have some life, so I used this Knock Wanderers set and picked out a dad and his daughter. I needed to attach them to a handle so I could handle them, and I did this by putting a spot of super glue on the top, spraying the figure with zapper for an instant set, and then just holding them in place for a couple of seconds. I need to paint a few hundred figures before I get good, but here's how I do it. I put out on my wet palette the colours that I wanted and I pre-mixed a dark, a medium and a light so I'd know what colour shades I was using. And then I painted the dark colour, which in this case is green, onto my figure. When that coat was dry, I went in with my medium colour and added highlights to his stomach and collars and sleeves and areas with creases and wrinkles before highlighting the very brightest, lightest bits with the light colour. Sorry, he's out of focus, but you get the idea. To bring out the shadows and details, I used Army Painter washes. I used a flesh wash on the face and I used a sort of strong tone and dark tone through the clothing to try and make everything have the correct shadows. When you've got a miniature like this, it's all about the darks and lights. Finally, I removed that masking tape and painted the sides with a matte black masonry paint. I designed and 3D printed a name label, painted it, and I was done. The scene was complete when I put all of the wagons, engine, and people in place. The actual photo is used in the backdrop. I just printed it out on some fairly thick copy paper in A3. And I like the fact that it's printed, it gives it kind of a painterly look. It's not as sharp. I tried putting a photo backdrop in and it didn't look as good as a printed and photoed one. Better to do it in camera. Though I did, I have to say, take my friend out <laughs> who's standing on that back ridge when it came to Photoshop because bless him, he was popping out the top of the loco and looked really odd. I moved the people around several times so they're in place with tacky wax. And actually the next morning, bless them, they'd all fallen over. Um, on their backs, thankfully, so that he's just pointing up into midair. But I like the idea of him trying to cross the river and I thought he was just a little high there. So I dropped him down a bit lower for the final photo. I've got to say, this was great fun to make. And I'm really pleased with how it came out. Quite often I look at a project and I think of all the things I could have done better. But actually this went really well, which is great. So if you've enjoyed watching it, then consider supporting the channel. Either subscribe, hit the bell button, support me on Patreon or visit my shop and buy something.
that will enable me to carry on making videos like this. See you next time.